Hello, this is going to be what feels like it could easily be part 14 of our game making tutorial. The last time we did some like menu UI stuff, um, or GUI stuff to give it a more satisfying name, but we made a few mistakes. <laughs> I need to correct some things. So I'll show you what it looked like. You already know, but I'm going to show you. Um, uh, so I can explain what's wrong with it because. So I was haunted by the, the feeling that obviously these the borders don't look right on that. And some of it's my fault and some of it isn't. <laughs> I was thinking none of it was my fault, but it's like, yeah, they, I don't know why the widthways borders seem so much smaller than the vertical borders, um, except the text can vary more vertically. Uh, but the fact that it's higher up than it should be, than the centipede, that is my fault. And the other thing is, um, I don't have this problem, but some people have, where the time when it highlights and the time it will detect the click do not line up to where the cursor is on your screen, and I'll explain why that is. It's because in our button script, this script is being called in the draw GUI event, and uh, the thing that I said was cool about the draw GUI event is that if you say x equals 100 in the draw GUI event, that means 100 pixels from the left of the screen, and it doesn't matter where in the room the screen is. So the screen can be panning across the huge open world, and 100 will always mean the same position on the screen, not in the world. Uh, but then I went and used mouse X and mouse Y, and mouse X and mouse Y are in world coordinates. So if your mouse is in the center of the screen, and then you move the screen around the, move the view around the world, mouse X and mouse Y are changing all the time. So you can't use those in, in draw GUI. You need the GUI version, um, which is, is it device, mouse, mouse, Scrolling along window, mouse X to GUI, and then you put a zero in brackets because of reasons. Um, it's actually like I think it's, if you had more than one mouse plugged in, you could specify which mouse. I don't know why you have that on this, but not on their normal mouse commands. Uh, but anyway, all of the mouse X's should be replaced with that. All of the mouse Y should be replaced with this. Um, there's only a couple, so we're okay. And maximize this. Right, that all that's fine now. Um, that will get the GUI coordinates. If you would like to know what the coordinates of some other object are on the screen, and your screen can be zooming in and rotating <laughs> and zooming out, then uh, you have a difficult task ahead of you. But luckily, I've already solved it, and it's on the Heat Signature website, uh, heatsig.com. Um, there's probably a bit advanced for the the kind of stuff that we're doing at the moment, but um, that was a problem I ran into with heat signature lately. I wanted to be able to have tooltips annotate things that are in the world, um, and I wanted to draw them on the GUI layer because I didn't want them to be scaled or rotated when you rotate the view. Um, but I needed to know what is the GUI coordinate of something that's in the world, and also, by the way, my view might be rotated by minus 236 degrees, and it might be zoomed in so that a vast kilometers of space all fit on one screen. <laughs> and it's a tricky problem. Luckily for my, for the, just for the mouse coordinates, there's a special way of getting the exact um, GUI location, and we've done it. The other thing is, um, I'm going to edit this a bit to be more clear. So this bit, box top equals current Y. Current Y is our kind of running total of what's the last, what's the next position for the um, next GUI element. So um, when you finish something, you want to add some margins onto it, as we do here current y equals current y plus margin times 3. Uh, let's put that in brackets. It's already working fine, but um, just to illustrate what that means, means add a chunk onto our, mar onto our current position so that the next thing we do won't be touching the last thing we did, that we have a bit of a gap. Um, so the top of the box should be at the current y. Current y is, is where we want the top of the current URI element to be. But then we also draw the text at the current y. Um, and uh, that is a problem. We want the we actually want text top to equal box top plus margin. The text should be moved down by one margin. Um, and then just before we do this, we don't get to specify our, where we want to draw the text because we always draw it the current y. So let's just update the current y equals text top. That's where we want the top of the text to be. And then after it's done, we don't need to add on three margins anymore, we only need to add on two. So let's check those two things both worked. 
Let's also check that we're recording. Yeah. If it does work, I'll show you what the next exciting problem is. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so it's it's further down now. It looks slightly better. It's still not exactly centered, but if you'd like to get it exactly centered, you will go mad. <laughs> so the next problem is when we start the game, for me, I'm always haunted by this feeling, but it looks a little bit squished, a little bit stretched with ways. Um, and a commenter, whose name I'll mention in the description because I can't remember it off the top of my head, um, figured this out for me. Um, the problem is that all this stuff that we do on the menu create event, all this screen stuff, this actually needs to be done every time we enter a room. Like, not strictly all of it needs to be done when we enter a room, but we might as well. We should have um, a script that says something like initialize room, um, and we'll take all of that off, and we're going to put it in there, and we're not even going to do it on the menu create event because that's not really the time for it. The menu will only be created once, and we want this to happen every time we enter a room. We're going to enter rooms at least twice, um, and possibly in future we might want to be entering rooms all over the place. So, sorry, I just went a bit fast there. Uh, we open up our room, our start, and there's a button called Creation Code under Settings. And when you click that, this is code that will run when the room starts. And the order it happens in is if you've placed objects in this room, which we have, we've placed a menu object, uh, the room is created. Then all the items that you've placed in the room are created, uh, all the ones you've placed in the level editor, basically. And then each, as each one of those is put in the room, it runs its own create event. And then after all of their create events are done, the room creation code is run. And this code, it's handy to have something that just runs like without being attached to a particular object. But be very careful. If I said like X here, uh, equals 10, I don't know why I do that. If, if I did, how the hell does a game maker know what I mean by X in this context? This is just running on the room now. The room doesn't really have an X. Um, so all this stuff will have to be, we can check, but it's all generic commands. We set up some variables, but we don't depend on any properties of the object we're running on because um, uh, we don't care what object we're running on. So we run that on the start code for the start room. And then also in our game room, we run it here too. So now it should be nicely proportioned when it actually starts up. Um, might actually edit the code because I'm finding it's almost, I've got this little special thing on here. You don't need it. Um, I like to make the window smaller than my screen so that I can see it all. I can't play full screen because if I do, you can't see what happens. My recording software doesn't pick it up. So I have to run in a window, um, but you should be running in full screen because it's better. So that's, I think that's all the fixes. Oh, one last thing I wanted to, um, this is really just tweaking now. I have a word that, um, to remind myself not to get carried away tweaking things, um, which is twanking. <laughs> the definition of twanking is tweaking past the point where you're making any significant difference at all to what you're doing. Um, why am I not seeing what I expect to see here? This is on the title. And we want to edit button, button press, that's it. Um, I just wanted to add uh, a double margin at the side, just to compensate for the fact that the margins seem to be more at the top and bottom. Doesn't really matter, but let's do one last check and see if everything's fixed now. That looks pretty good. I've got a nice squat window now, so I don't have to worry about missing something off the bottom of the screen. And now, I don't know if you can compare this to uh, when I last played it, but everything looks correctly proportioned and it just kind of feels a bit crisper, it just there's something nicer about it. But resolution and scaling and stuff, I struggled for so long to get that right in Game Maker Studio, figure out how it works, have to figure out how to get past the way it works <laughs> so that it will just display everything at normal scale, like one to one. Um, I spent so long on that that I now have a sort of psychological disorder about it where I just always think, that, isn't that slightly blurry? Isn't that a little bit not quite proportioned correctly? I'm paranoid it's always fucking with my proportions. Um, so, the next thing we should do, got all our menu stuff sorted. Um, oh yeah, let's, it would be cool, so right now I just press escape to quit the game, but we've got a menu now for quitting, and pressing escape and have that immediately close the application and lose all of your progress is not great behavior. Um, so let's have the menu object carry across into the game. So we're going to make menu persistent. Uh, persistent checkbox means when you change rooms, it will come with you. Anything that's not persistent, when you change rooms, will be destroyed forever, completely gone forever. 
Um, even if you go back to that room somehow, the room is created afresh and all of the things that you place in that level will be created from scratch and nothing that you left in that room will be there again. When you leave a room, I think it's effectively destroyed. It doesn't, the game maker doesn't remember anything about it. Um, so if you want anything to survive the transition, you mark it as persistent. I, I didn't have much in Gunpoint that was persistent. Gunpoint had lots of different rooms. Um, the player wasn't persistent in Gunpoint. He was created every time you started. Um, and his inventory was persistent, so the, the objects you own, um, that was kind of kept track of. I don't know if that's the best way to do it. Um, but just so you know, like, don't mark everything as persistent. That can get messy. The menu is now persistent. Uh, we need to change, right now on the game object, we have this stuff about um, pressing escape to end the game. Let's just get rid of that. Um, we could get rid of this. I won't do it yet because we shouldn't do that until we actually uh, add a restart button. And actually, no, I'm going to get rid of it because we don't need a restart button. We've got a new game button. So if we go back into our menu, all this stuff, this is currently a start game, let's call it a new game, so that if you bring that up during the game, obviously if it said start game that would be weird, but if it says new game you get the idea that it's going to restart the game. So um, the thing is, right now our menu, let's I'll show you what happens <coughs> if we do it like this. We've made our menu persistent, we've made our game object not quit when we press escape, but our menu object is constantly displaying this. <laughs> it just always displays it. So it carries over correctly, but now it doesn't know not to show this. So we need the menu to have two modes. Um, so let's give it a create event, add some code, and we're going to say mode equals titles. So when it, the game starts, initially, on the create creation of the menu, it'll be in title mode. And uh, I should copy and paste that whole thing. And in the draw GUI event, all the stuff that we've written so far, we only want to do that if the mode is titles. Select everything and press the tab to indent it. So all that will only display if our mode is titles. And then when we go to um, this go to the next room thing, we're going to change that to be room go to... We always want it to go to um, uh, our game. And we also want it to change the mode to game. Might. I don't think this matters, but I'm going to have it change the mode before we switch rooms, just in case switching rooms destroys us before we have a chance to execute the next line. I'm pretty sure that isn't the case, but it makes sense just logically to change our mode, then move on. So when you click New Game, it's going to always take us to the game room, even if we executed that command from the game room. It will, taking you to a room, like I say, destroys the room and recreates it. Um, destroys the current room and creates the new one. And if it's the same one as the current one, then it destroys this instance, the current one, and creates a new one. So that's good. And then right now in game mode, nothing will happen. Is that what we want? Yeah, that's fine. Um, but we do want a way to bring this menu up, obviously, because right now it's going to vanish forever. So let's give our menu a step event, which is where you want to do things that process key presses and stuff. Ideally, you would like that menu clicking behavior to be somehow on the step event, like you're not meant to put too much code in the draw event because it the draw event runs slowly. I never really run into trouble from that. Um, and in our case, we're just detecting a click and we're doing it on a menu, which is not very taxing. Uh, like it's just a menu room. Um, but wherever we can, wherever it's easy to, we might as well put this code on the step event. And here it's easy to do that because all we need is if keyboard check pressed VK escape, then now, we don't just want to always bring up the title, because if you're already in the title and you press escape, you'd expect it to return you to the game. So we want to say, if mode equals game, then mode equals titles, else mode equals game. So that says, if we're already in the game mode, take us to the titles, otherwise, take us to the game. So this only supports two modes, obviously. Um, and because of this else statement, we actually don't care what mode we're in. If we're not in the titles mode, then escape should take us to the game. If we added a third mode, we'd need to edit this in some way. Um, let's see if that works. I think that's everything. Start the game. Menu doesn't carry over. I press escape. It comes up. 
And if I press new game, the room restarts. And if I press quit, we quit. Perfect. Okay, um, so that's basically all the like actual menu stuff. But now that we've got menu stuff running in game, um, the next logical step would be to do some uh, actual. What would be the word? I mean, GUI, yes. Uh, HUD, I guess. Interface elements that are overlaid on the game. HUD, I think, is, is the most common way of referring to that. Um, but right now we have nothing to represent because we did such a great job of making sure all of the relevant information to our game is in some way embodied visually in the level. So, you know, how much health does an enemy have? Well, it depends on his size. Or if he's red, he's only ever got one health point. Um, so once you know the rules, everything is apparent from looking at it. We don't need any UE elements to tell us, like, you know, how many hit points does the player have? Only ever one. So um, that's good. I like that in general. But let's intentionally add something, add some hidden information that we will then need a UE element to explain. Um, I've probably prattled on about this too much already, but um, I, for what it's worth, I like to reduce the amount of hidden information that needs a UE element to explain it. But uh, we will add one anyway. So what I'd like is a concept of like power. So when you die in this, your player is destroyed and a new one is created. Right now that has no cost really. You drop your weapons, but you pick them straight back up again. Um, it would be cool if you were building something up as you fought enemies, and then when you die, you lost it. And you could pick it up, get it back up again, but then there'd be a proper death penalty. So I'm going to create a concept. What I'd like is basically when you kill an enemy, it should leave some kind of pickup. When you take that pickup, you sort of level up in some way. Um, so let's actually create a sprite for it. Blobs of stuff that are good. <laughs> we already have a blob sprite, which is the liquid shot. I'm going to duplicate that, I'm going to edit it, I'm going to colorize it under images, and we'll make it green. Green is the international language for good things. Um, I'm having such a hard time getting a good green. I guess that. I'm actually also going to um, I'm going to make it a bit darker because um, it's never a good idea to uh, depend entirely on uh, saturation. Or maybe I'll make it brighter. Is that brighter? Can't tell. <laughs> oh, I see. So that's how it works. Yeah, we're going to make it brighter. Um, not by much. But if you depend entirely on colour to distinguish two things that are very different, then... Um, Anyone who's colorblind to those particular colors can't tell, and uh, it's okay. Like you'll never make your game look perfect for everyone with every variety of um, uh, differently colored vision, but uh, it's worth making your game playable at least <laughs> for colorblind people. Because I think about ten percent of all um, men, at least, are colorblind. I think it's less in women, um, so it's a fairly big deal. So, and you see, like a lot of games have colorblind modes. In fact. Gunpoint does as well. Um, but if you kind of bear it in mind from the start, it's not too hard to just make sure that you don't even need one because just make everything communicated in at least two ways. And it's better for people who um, don't have color blindness because having things communicated in more than one way makes things clearer. In this case, we're doing a pathetic job of it, which is making it very slightly lighter than the other thing. But uh, if we had like a symbol or an icon on it, that would be even better. So we created a sprite. We're going to create an object. Give it that power up. Sprite. Oh, power up. Um, let's not give it any code just yet. In fact, it might never have any code. And I think they should only come from shrinking enemies. We made it green, so it makes sense that it comes from the green enemy. And also, shrinking enemies are difficult to hurt, uh, difficult to kill. Um, and right now, they're quite unsatisfying. The exploding enemies are fantastic. They erupt in a shower of things. Those things cause more damage, and that creates train reactions. And they're very easy, very satisfying. Um, so I don't think we, they need a reward for killing them. And if we put the reward on the shrinking enemy, then the exploding enemies kind of change status, because now they're not a thing that you have to defeat for the sake of it. They're things that you use as tools to damage the shrinking enemies. You'll see that bit when I actually play it, but um, if you've messed around with this game, um, or if your game is very similar and you've messed around with that, you'll have found that killing an exploding enemy next to a shrinking enemy is one of the best ways to kill a shrinking enemy, because it does loads of damage all at once. Um, so now, when a shrinking enemy is hit by a projectile, you shrink, um, but we're also going to create a power up. For instance, create x, y, o, power up. Simple enough. And then, next thing to do is for the player to pick things up, and first we'll give you a power amount, 
a power variable. When the player is created, the power will be 5. And we'll also make it a maximum power. Let's call it power max, because <laughs> that's a cool term. Um, so initial power is 5, power max is going to be 50. So you can, if you collect enough of these things, it'll go all the way up to 50. And then in the step event, and just in the same way as we check for things like um, collisions, we are going to check for um, power up collected equals instance place x, y, o power up and let's copy that if instance exists power up collected then um, with power up collected instance destroy that is when we pick it up have it remove it from the world and actually um, okay I'll, I'll write what's going to happen we want power equals power plus one that's all we want to happen but if our power is um, at the maximum we don't want that to happen so we actually want if power um, less than or equal to power max then we do this um, but if it's not then not only do we not want to increase our power but we also don't even want to pick it up because then it would be wasting it and it's annoying in games when walking over a pickup that you don't need uses up the pickup and then you can't have it when you do need it um, so let's see we can't test that well we, okay so what we'll test is do power ups come out of enemies and can we pick them up obviously the fact that our power is increasing is something we can't test yet because our power doesn't do anything <laughs> our powers do nothing um, so, oh, there we go. Yeah, he's eating a good old trail. It looks like blood, doesn't it? <laughs> so we're just drinking his blood. It's a perfectly ordinary mechanic. You just hurt people to make them bleed and then drink their blood off the floor. Like, lick it off the floor. That's how our game works. <laughs> um, so that's kind of cool. But the power should do something. And the thing, there's lots of different things we could do with it, and there are lots that would be better than what I'm going to do. <laughs> but for simplicity's sake, the main limitation we've got right now is a single shotgun is very slow to fire. And right now its rate of fire is... Um, uh, we measure how many seconds it was since our last shot. And um, if it's greater than the seconds between shots value, we let ourselves fire. So let's make... If we have an owner, as long as we ha like someone's using us, then seconds between shots equals... Um, we want it to be... Let's have it be like one second between shots when the player's power is five. So five. Okay, so the other thing to note is seconds between shots is a bad thing. The higher this is, the less powerful we are. Uh, because the longer we have to wait between shots, the less powerful we are. So we want it to be something like one divided by um, owner.power. So we assume the, the owner has a power statistic if we gave guns to enemies in future, we'd need to give them a power statistic, power variable. <laughs> Let's avoid what, saying the word statistic. Um, so this is this makes it inversely proportional. This means the higher the power is, the smaller the seconds between shots. I.e. the higher the power is, the more often we can fire, the more rapidly we can fire. But like I say, it'd be good if the initial value equated to one. So like initially it's about one second between shots. Then as we gain power, if we had um, uh, 10 power, then it would be half a second between shots. So after five pickups, we would have doubled our fire rate. That feels about right, right? Well, it seems reasonable. Um, so that will work okay. I hope. Is it happening in the background for some reason? Yes, it is. So, initially, very slow firing and quite irritating. And then as we pick these up, I'm just going to hold down fire all the time so you can see it happening. As we pick them up, they're growing a bit faster. And this is actually feeling alright already. And then as we get more of these, growing even faster. And then because we're firing faster, we're also getting power ups quicker from these enemies. <laughs> and now we've done quite a lot of damage to these guys. As we're picking these up, it's getting faster and faster and faster. <laughs> and I'm actually going to have to stop firing just so I can pick these up because the kick is now so much that it's difficult to control. 
And now we got a properly rapid fire gun. And oh, we've hit Parallax, so now we're not picking up any anymore. And that's pretty good. That's pretty fun. I might even let Parallax be a bit higher than that, because I think we can go even further. And now, what happens if I die? I'm destroyed. New player I've created. New player gets my gun, because we left it where it was. And now that's as fast as I can fire. But I can go around and pick up all these power-ups that, that I didn't get a chance to pick up last time. But we can't really sort of see our power, so let's add the UE element. I will just tweak that. Um, what do we say? Power max was 50. Let's make it 75. So it can get really high now. Um, so now, on our menu object, we set it up so that it has a separate um, mode for game. So we'll say, have I talked about LCIF before? So we want to say, oh, is that LCIF mode equals game? So this is what we do with the mode is titles. If it's not titles, we could just say else here and always do this. But if we added more modes later, it would be better if whatever we're about to write doesn't automatically get added to all the other modes. So we, want, we do want to check if mode equals game. We could also do it like that, that's fine. But if you do else if, then we only get here if it wasn't true there. Um, so for example, if like, in fact, right in here, we set mode to game. If we did these two separate statements, then both of them could execute, because this could execute, and then we see, oh, we're in game mode, and we should do this. We don't really want that to happen. We want to wait until next time we do this if statement. Um, we want to draw a bar. So let's set up some parameters for it. Let's, like, I want it to be at the bottom of the screen. don't want it to be touching the edges of the screen exactly. So we'll do something like um, box indent equals 50. That's how far in from the screen it'll be. Um, and we can do that for the bottom as well. And therefore, actually no, sorry, not box, bar, let's call it a bar. Um, and then we'll say like, bar width should be the width of the port. Remember the port is how big our screen is in pixels. Um, and it doesn't depend on how much of the room we're seeing. And it doesn't depend on what zoom level or rotation or position of the room, of the view. Uh, it'll always be the same. So that minus bar indent times two. So if our bar is going to span nearly the width of the screen, but we want it to be indented by 50 pixels each side, then the total width will be the width of our screen minus 100. Um, and then, what should we say about bar height? Um, bar height equals, let's make it like 20 pixels high. And then what will the top of the bar be? It will be the bottom of the port that's the height of the port, because remember we start at zero at the top and then go down. Um, so if our port is a thousand pixels high, then the y coordinate at the bottom most pixel will be 1000. Um, so that minus bar indent minus bar height. And we'll put that in brackets, because what we're going to do is take that thousand value. Um, we want to go up by the indent, that's where the bottom of the bar would be and then the top of the bar will be the height above that. And then if we wanted to draw it right now, we'd say draw a rectangle. Um, bar indent will be the left coordinate. The top one will be bar top, we've written that already. The right one will be bar indent plus bar width. The left plus the width of the thing is the right hand side. And the bottom will be um, bar top plus bar height. And then we'd say false because we don't want to be an outline. So I'll put spaces in that to I'll put spaces in the right place to make it clearer. I hit a whole bunch of keys then, I don't know what <laughs> they were. Um, so yeah, that's the left coordinate, that's the top coordinate. Then to get the right coordinate we add on the width to the left, and to get the bottom coordinate we add on the height to the top. <coughs> but Remember when you draw something, it happens in whatever the current settings are. We, haven't, we don't have any settings yet, so we need to do things like draw set color. Let's make it green like all the other stuff. Um, and let's leave it as alpha. Well, no, actually, let's, it's hard, so we can make it a, like less than maximum alpha. Make it 0.7. And after we've done that, we'll set it back to 1 so that nothing else is affected by that. 
Um, doesn't matter about draw, setting the draw color. Um, is that everything? Oh wait, <laughs> so that what that does is draw a bar. In fact, yeah, let's actually keep that. So we're going to say outline equals true. So what I've, what I've specified there is the, the full width of the bar, the biggest the bar can ever be. Obviously you want a bar to start at nothing, or start at a small amount and then fill the, that capacity. Um, so if we say outline equals true, then this will just be the outline of where the, um, the power, the area the power bar can fill, um, be like a frame. And then for the one that's not an outline, that's actually going to fill it in, instead of plus bar width, we want it to fill a fraction of the um, of the bar width. So what should the fraction be? Well, it should be o player dot power divided by o player dot power max. That is the fraction of power that he has. When power is equal to power max, that'll be one. When power is zero, it'll be zero. When power is half of power max, that'll be a half. Uh, so we'll call it power fraction. And then for the filled bar, instead of bar width, we want bar width times that fraction. So if you're at half power, we want the width of this to be half the maximum width. If you're at zero power, we want it to be zero. If you're at, at like almost full, then we want it to be almost all of the bar width. Um, the only thing we need to check is what if the player's dead? The player's dead will crash right now because we're asking him to check its power value and it, he doesn't exist. So we'll do all of this under instance exists o player not forgetting the last S. And now none of this will happen at all if the player doesn't exist. So when the player dies, you should see the, the power bar disappear. Um, that was quite a lot of typing, <laughs> so let's find out what I did wrong. Okay, hey, there it is. It's quite nice. Well, it's Kind of a shitty green. <laughs> I don't want Mr. to complain, but um, shoot this guy. Get a few power ups and go in. As I pick you up, you can see the bar filling. Now the bar's filling a lot. Ooh, this is getting a little bit tight. And it's filling even more. And I've got quite a rapid fire gun now. This is going to get crazy by the end of it. <laughs> this is even half full and it's already pretty rapid. It's actually, like, this isn't intentional, but um, because of the kick, the more rapidly you're firing, the harder it is to pick these things up. <laughs> so, like, it doesn't entirely balance out, but it um, adds a slight extra element of challenge as things get crazier. So let's move all these up. I'm nearly at max power now. It's getting pretty crazy. <laughs> Fuck, I died. <laughs> and so, yeah, the power bar disappeared. And then when we respawn, we've only got a little bit, and we can see we need to pick up more of these things to get more. And when you have low power, it's quite important to do this and set up chain reactions that way, so you can get loads of power quickly. When you've got high power, strategy is less important, and you can just lower everyone down. So the balance of this might be totally off, and you might want to do it in a totally different way. But it's already starting to feel so much more like a game. It's like, there's challenge, there's a way to, to sort of lose something that's of value to you. Um, there's a sense of power when this thing is at maximum, it's kind of crazy, look at my guy gibbering. And actually, particularly, yeah, if we let the view scroll because of this, then the fact that the view is juddering feels, makes it feel more powerful, so that's essentially a, a very like accidental, cheap version of screen shake, um, which is a great thing that we should add at some point properly. Um, but yeah, that's cool. We've got the bar, it represents things, um, and the thing represents is kind of fun to mess around with. So I'm going to leave this one there. Um, these are probably going to get a bit less frequent um, because we're coming up to GDC and Resed, uh, both of which I'm going to. I'm going to talk at GDC on efficiency for game designers, which is um, how to like design the ideas for your game to make your game easier to make and how to uh, get through it productively. Um, and then at Res, I'm going to be showing Heat Signature um, for the public to play. That's an event in London um, that's all about indie games. And there's some prep to do for those things. And also, um, well, most of it, I just really need to get Heat Signature ready um, for those things, if, you know, ready for people to, to actually play. Um, and that is a big, difficult job, and there's a deadline on it, which um, I don't like. 
And also, these episodes are taking longer to do because it's getting complicated enough now that I can't do it all on the fly. First few, I could just do it, like make it up as I went along. But then increasingly, I found I was making errors and I had to basically redo the whole episode because I fucked something up. So now I kind of I do a practice run before I record them, and that takes time. And the practice runs are taking longer as it gets more complicated. Um, so I can't afford to do them like, you know, four times a week. Uh, it's probably more like once a week now. Um, and to be honest, we don't have that many more to go, I don't think. I've got in my head about like four different concepts I want to cover. There might be one episode each, or there might be several episodes each. Um, we'll see how we go. Uh, if there's anything you really, really feel you don't are like out of your depth with that is really important for you to understand, that you'd like me to cover, then say so in the comments. Uh, but other than that, I'll just kind of play it by ear. So thanks.